Brookfield State Ex Bank for sponsoring this event, as well as our lead sponsor for the whole season, which is the Frankenberg. Um, we do have, we just put out um, pictures of ice water and cups back there. At the end, we will also have out platters of watermelon from a uh, real cool farmer I know that um, is a great girl, so I'll uh, we'll just leave it at that. And then there's a donation basket for the watermelon if you're interested, but also, again, it basically costs us $250 to open our doors without air conditioning on um, a night like this. So um, there is always the donation box in the back or our end of year appeal. Um, two coming events that I just want to announce are the next Thursday, so a week from Thursday, September 6th, we're having an open mic night. And part of that is actually not so much this event, but um, last year when we had the Growing Up in Brookfield tales, um, things like that, that there are people that don't necessarily get asked and it's not a slight, you just, you know, <coughs> think or know those types of things. So, if you have a story, if you have a joke, if you want to read a poem, if you want to sing a song, anything like that, that will be in the Herald this week. I think it's in the email blast that will be going out next week. So we are just asking for some registration just to, you know, get an idea of the crowd. Um, you can play music. The only thing in there, we're basically asking that, you know, it's not going to be, you know, a chamber music quartet that needs to then tune up because we're asking for no more than a three minute transition in between to make it a uh, um, fast paced evening. So um, we'd love to see you there. And the other one is a big event in mid September. It is the Sunday of Tunbridge Fair weekend. So after you've eaten all of your fried whatever, you're going to want some healthy soup. And that is our Super Supper event. I believe it's our fifth annual, but I could be wrong. Um, and that is a fundraiser that we do for the Old Town Hall and the um, Randolph Food Shelf. So it's a great event. It's the Sunday of Tunbridge Fair. So as you know, the fair shuts down at 5. We open at 6. So perfect. Um, and we will hope to see you. And there's other events in September that you will also get notice on. Um, I just want to say before I introduce Keith, um, I got the idea for this event when, oh, I don't know if it was even a couple years after I moved to town, so-called, in 1990. Alan Wheatley was telling me how they used to clean the syrup pans. Um, and I don't know if it was when you were a kid or what you, but anyway, that stuck with me. And when I talked to him about doing this event, he then added about actually how the method fit with the farm chores for the seasonal, you know, how it fit in with getting the work done. And so it's just a fascinating interest. And then last year when we had the growing up in Brookfield stories, Keith did such a great job of asking questions from the audience that, you know, sorry. Even though we don't want to do it next year, that's that. And then one other thing you might notice, maybe you've noticed, is at this point, I'm the only female facing you. We will take care of that next year when we have the females all up here. And I'm probably going to require that all of you attend to hear <laughs> that part. But anyway, um, so I'm not sure if you, if you, you know, we'll talk to you about if you want to help with that event next year or not. But that's the plan. So. Um, Hopefully, we'll see you next year as well. So, and I'm sorry, Pete. <laughs> so this is, is that good there? Yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, Keith Sprague, um, extremely honored to be here tonight, to be asked to do this. Um, and, and of course, I would continue to do it uh, if I was asked again next year. Uh, just a slight joke. Um, anyway, uh, with that, being honored to do this and to lead uh, this group of, of uh, foreigners uh, through this discussion, um, uh, it's very much honoring, like I've said, uh, but I, I use that word very lightly, leading uh, this group of farmers because I, my entire life I've worked with this generation and I haven't seen anybody lead them to this point. Uh, <laughs> they'll listen. Uh, 
know, they usually tend to go their own directions after that. <laughs> so I think it'll be, you'll see that on display here tonight. So. Uh, but uh, all kidding aside, um, what we have here is a, is a group of uh, a generation that grew up on farms, of farmers uh, in their day uh, as they were kids, and then some of them even, you know, continue to make a living doing it. Um, uh, so they not only pioneered uh, farming and what it's become today, um, but they pioneered a way of life uh, that is seeked uh, by many people, even to this day. There's people that, that just want to live the life that these guys have lived their entire life. Uh, I mean, from childhood right up uh, until this point. Um, so with that uh, being said, this night is about these guys. And um, also with that being said, this night is about you in the audience. And um, because of my poor social skills, I'm going to need some help from you guys um, in getting these guys going. With that being said, I. I uh, say with warning, last year I asked, I think, five questions, maybe six, and here I am. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll be counting questions. Anybody get close to that? We're going to start making lists. <laughs> um, so also, with that being said, uh, if there is a question, please raise your hand. And, and honestly, I hope there's tons of them. Um, and we'll get you the microphone. Um, and... Uh, and those reasons are because we are being recorded. Um, so it's not only us that are here. Uh, there's people that this will, will be watching this for a long time. Come. So with that being said, I'm going to uh, ask these guys to say a few words about the farms that they grew up on. Um, what it was for a farm. If they can take maybe three to five minutes and describe their farm. And then from there, I have some questions. If some questions aren't arising, and we'll just go from there. Um, and I, I did not ask, what do we have for a time line here? Are we an hour? Is that? You know? Okay. Okay. Great. So I'll, I'll start uh, with Stuart. If you just introduce yourself and your, and your fire. And... Uh, good evening. I'm Stuart Osha. And uh, I grew up with. All of these gentlemen. We were kids once. Um, in East Brookfield, um, our farm, which is the Ocean Farm on Route 14, uh, Sprague's farm most of it now. Um, I've always thought that I was so blessed and I've been so thankful to grow up in that era where we had farm life uh, and friendship and parents all had friendship and just such a great time. And so I've always been thankful for that. Um, we farmed there I, until I graduated in high school. And uh, I didn't go on to farming directly, unlike some of these gentlemen here who have spent their lives farming. Um, but had great memories there and had my own farming experience later in life. Um, but it was all good, and I just will reiterate that it was such a wonderful time to grow up, uh, wonderful farm life, the neighbors helped each other, and um, we had a great time as kids. So I grew up down the road from the older farm, you know, the weekly farm. Uh, when I was growing up, we probably milked 30 to 35 cows fed hay and pasture. Uh, I do I remember my brother and I all did the milking before we went to school and then we'd catch a ride to Spalding and then we'd hitchhike home at night. And kids today can't understand how you do that, but back then, you know, you could hitchhike home from Barry in about an hour because everybody knew you were a kid trying to get a ride home. But uh, we sugared, you know, probably tapped around 500, 
got into horses. And we were quite young. We, treat we got to, we got to ride the work horses back home when we got down to the end of the day. <laughs> <laughs> but the story that Paul Hill told about the sugar hands, a friend of mine, Paul Stacy, told me that. So I was sugaring on late one spring, and it was getting time to get on the spring work, and he said, well, we used to just flood the pans with sap, and, and then by July, when we get on the A and we'll go back, and it had turned to acid and it cleaned right up. <laughs> <laughs> and said, well, then we all try that. <laughs> and if that didn't work, a slick. <laughs> well, I'll uh, turn the mic over. I will say I continued on the farm, and uh, we ended up, I, I milked. I had 200 head and milked 100 at the end and sold my milk cows in 97 and been working with keep raising heifers now we have about 200 heifers down there. I'm Eaton Stone, had a farm over in the Keeler neighborhood, Kibbe Kibbe neighborhood over here. It was, a big, it was a big farm years ago, but by the time I came along, it got kind of dwindled down. My grandfather milked uh, three, four, half a dozen cows by hand. And we made the churn of butter. There used to be a, a locker down in Randolph, a big floor. We'd walk in the floor. We had lockers for like drawers that you could pull out and put meat or whatever you had in there to keep. And my dad had, I think, two or three lockers down there. So then in the summer we made butter and then put it in the locker for winter. And my grandfather was a good hand now. But I got into that a little bit. And then I went, to, where I went to school was a Gilman school there. It was a one room schoolhouse. When I graduated, I was the only one in the eighth grade. <laughs> They weren't going to hold a ceremony for me, so they shipped me out of Randolph Center with the rest of the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so then I went to VTC, and, and then I went to Cabot, worked a couple of years up there, and came back down. And that time I got married, thought maybe I would get a job. <laughs> so I helped the area farmers around there getting in hay. And, Cleaning the barn and stuff. My dad was a good gardener. He usually had about three gardens. My brothers and I were out there. We got to pull the weeds mostly. So, so Eaton was it? Was it what, 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 Was it dairy and sawmill? Was that like the, the main sources of income on the farm? Yeah, we had that little mill too. We ran for years. We put a lot of lumber through that little mill. And then, after a while, my dad, like I said, he was a pretty good gardener, and he decided he wanted some raspberries. So he tilled up a place and planted some raspberries, and we had a raspberry patch. And for a while, through the summer, the money from the raspberries was what about the groceries. Dad used to keep track of everything, every penny, every berry. And he said that one year we picked 650 quarts of fat. We got sick of picking grass. <laughs> All right, we'll let these guys introduce themselves there and we'll open up the questions. I'm Dennis Hill. I grew up in a farm down in Brookfield Center. Uh, youngest of five. We, uh, small dairy farm. Uh, I think the largest number we had at one time milking was uh, 15 Holsteins. Uh, my dad, a lot of folks here knew my dad. Uh, he farmed there up until three months before he died. He was a male here in town for uh, 38 years. And farming was his life. I decided after high school that farming wasn't my life. So I left one off in the military and came back and went through a couple of different careers. But I have to tell you, growing up on a dairy farm in Vermont was the best thing that could ever happen. Uh, 
here in Eden talk about the uh, lockers down in Randolph. It was Peck's Market, that's how I remember. Yeah. I remember whenever we'd uh, call a cow, we'd butcher the cow on the barn floor and cut it up and take it down and put it in the meat locker and then we'd go down once a week and get our meat and what we're going to eat for the week. We didn't have much of a freezer even at that point. Yeah. And, uh, I, I do remember, though, that uh, my mom worked at the hospital. She was a medical record librarian. And I do remember that uh, Peck's Market would get seafood once in a while. And my folks would get clams. And they'd come home and thought that clam stew was just about the best thing there ever was. And I couldn't even look at the stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one thing that I remember that I think really changed dairy farming a lot was the advent of the vault tank. And they did, did away with the uh, milk cans. Mm -hmm. It used to be all the farms had a, uh, a milk room, a milk house, and they had a cooler, which uh, was nothing more than a glorified cold water going through it, keeping the milk at a certain temperature. Mm -hmm. And so you lug the milk down, you have the can, you strainer on the can, you put, pour the milk through the strainer down in the can, you lift the can up, put it inside the cooler, and it was guys with trucks. Uh, quite often, other farmers that would have a milk group and they'd come around and pick it all up, take it to the processing center. And you know, some of the stories I, I can't I can't detail all of them, but some of the stories some of these guys used to tell about some of these guys that were rugged would each pick up a can in each hand and just roll them up. Well, let me tell you, those things were some heavy. I got I had to get quite old before I could even lift one of them. But uh, again, dairy farming was uh, totally different than you know most everybody at that point. Back when I was growing up, you only had one tractor, and one tractor was all they had. And not everybody had all the equipment. It was trading back and forth of work. One might have a baler, one might have a corn planter, and that's how it went back and forth. And one might have a combine, you might have a tractor that was big enough to run the combine to do that or to cut the corn. Uh, we raised, I can remember as a kid, we raised a lot of sweet corn, and I remember picking a whole bunch of sweet corn every summer. We take it and it had a little GNC pickup with a wood body on the back. We throw ears of corn in there all day long and take them down to the old canning factory in Randolph, which is located down by the old Ethan Allen plant. It's now a storage area down there. But that used to be a canning factory. And you'd sit down there and they had a conveyor belt. You'd back your truck up there and you'd sit there and throw the corn on that and you'd get paid so much a pound or whatever. I never had part of the money, but you know. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, hello. Uh, I'm Guy Waldo. Grew up on Brookfield East Hill. And my father and my folks had uh, cows and 20 jerseys. And uh, there was always some competition between the jerseys and the Holsteins. But, you know, jerseys kind of won. <laughs> and later on, one of the jokes was that uh, we should actually get a Holstein so we could clean out the buckets. <laughs> Anyway, uh, my father was diversified in, in the income. He, uh, it's pretty amazing, he had 20 cows and six kids. And he made his income right there off the land. And he also had raspberries, and he had some strawberries he sold, and had blueberries. He was, in the area, he had one of the largest blueberry plant collections around Brookfield for a long time, and uh, that supplemented the income. We also sugared. And he had uh, chickens in one barn. We took down to Race's store and uh, supplied them for uh, their, their regular customers to go there and get the uh, the eggs that we raised. So that was it was pretty remarkable for a fellow in a family with 20 cows to survive. And we did, and we probably weren't very well off, but we didn't know it, so it didn't matter. So. We were, you know, looking back, we had the hand-me-down clothes and, and uh, other goodies. And I'll tell you one thing about the water supply was a couple thousand, maybe 2,500 feet away, way up on the hill. It was a spring, and it wasn't too good. And so water was always rationed. And you begin to realize that when you're the third one to get in the bathtub. <laughs> Oh yeah, and we were attacking the same water. It wasn't as warm as it was at one time. <laughs> but that's the way we grew up, and just, uh, we were fairly isolated. We could see one other house and barn up on the hill, but that was it. 
And when you were young and growing up and all of a sudden a vehicle came through, boom, you got behind the maple tree. <laughs> and you peeked around and figured out who it was. And if you didn't know, you didn't come out. <laughs> so that was, and that was, we had some good times. Back in those years, there was crust. And we had, you could actually go out and if any slope on the land, you could slide all day long on, on a, a sled that had iron, the rails were iron, and, and you wouldn't go through. And we haven't had a crust like that in probably 20 or 30 years, a real one. But uh, that's how we grew up. And for entertainment, we had skis with a single leather strap. So that was way back. But uh, that's how, where we grew up, and uh, I thought it was all remarkable when Father made it with 20 cows. Uh, did you run the pipeline uh, system with the sugar back then? We did. Father had a, it was uh, metal, and it was before the, the uh, plastic came out, and he would, he tapped around a thousand, but uh, yeah, he had a pipeline that ran, strung wires through, and uh, that system worked pretty well. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, branches would get into it, but uh, he actually sugared for quite a few years and, and uh, part of the income, did well. So what was that, like open trays? Yeah, well, it was, it had three pieces to it. And uh, when he got done sugaring, that's where the stuff stayed and didn't collect it. And, uh, yeah, just go for it. Just go. <laughs> that's a lifetime thing, part. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm John Sprague, lived down on Route 14. Uh, my, and I had uh, two brothers, uh, the, uh, sister, when we grew up together. Uh, so I was the youngest boy, so I knew what it was to get uh, knocked around. So uh, <laughs> you, you learned right off to start with uh, what it was to be the lowest one on Totem pole. Uh, so anyway, uh, we we milked uh, I think about 30 cows. Uh, we had a fair, for the time we had a fairly modern uh, barn. We had a lytic area which had a track and load uh, manure into it and roll it out and and, and dump it into a pit or. Uh, and in the winter, I can remember uh, hitching, I was probably three years old or so, but I can remember hitching the horses up for helping and, and taking the manure out and going across the main road, throwing snow on the main road and spreading the manure out of a sled <laughs> on, uh, on the ground. I can remember the uh, highway crew used to stop and complain something and put snow on the road. <laughs> uh, Okay, so my, and that's some of my earliest remembrance, but as thinking about farming, uh, my grandfather farmed there before uh, my father did, uh, and he was, they more or less subsided off what they raised on the farm. They, they had goats and sheep and whatever, uh, but my great-grandfather uh, was part of starting the Gulf Road Creamery. And, and then my grandfather, who was a school teacher, uh, took to going to Boston and, and selling, it's like the Gulf Road Creamery made uh, butter. And so he, he, uh, he went to Boston, it probably was more than a day's trip. <laughs> But anyways, it's selling butter. And so when my uh, father come in line, uh, my grandfather helped him change the barn over. It's an upstairs stable. And an upstairs stable is all wooden, and you, and you tie the cows all up in wooden stanchions, and then behind them, uh, you, you open up a grate, and, uh, and the manure went down below. Uh, and, and so anyway, they converted the barn to a cement barn <coughs> with well, the silo, the hay, went in the mail, and it was on the same level as the cows. 
and it had uh, in the hay barn was all set up with a hay fork, which you come into the hay, and you pick the hay up and and uh, drop it in the mail. So getting back to the Gulfport Creamery, my father was the first one that actually had a market and he sold cream and then milk to the Gulfport Creamery. And, uh, and, and from there, uh, we got a, a bulk tank when I was oh, probably 15, 16 years old. Uh, and you know, farming just changed dramatically from from then. Uh, but when <clears throat> when I was oh, back, I can just remember back in the war, back in '46, uh, in that area, our neighbors started buying tractors, and tractors were hard to come by. And I can remember our neighbors. I think it was the Martins got a tractor and had iron wheels on it because during the war they didn't put rubber tires. And uh, but a year or two later we got a tractor and our, our other neighbors did and they had rubber tired, uh, rubber tires on their, their tractors. Mm -hmm. uh, and we and the farmers uh, all worked together. It's like corn, cotton, they had a harvester they would cut the corn, put it in a bundle uh, with a like bale string around it, and there would be probably a dozen of salt stalks or maybe a few more. And they'd leave it there a day and let it dry. And, and then the neighbors would come in, and they'd pick it up uh, and put it in a in a what they call the, a, a chopper blower. And it'd go in this conveyor into the blower and blow it up into the silo. Uh, and as a kid, I got to get up in the silo and level it off and throw corn cobs at my brother. <laughs> Being the younger one, I got most of the cobs. So. <laughs> uh, but it, that, that was, uh, and the hand was, was done with. Uh, you had what they call the hay loader. It's a conveyor thing. You drive over the hay, it would go up a chute onto a wagon or a truck. Uh, and, and, and then you would go in and back it in under a hay fork. Hay fork, pick it up, raise it up, and run it down a trolley uh, in the hay mail. And, and then you had a trick roll, and you would dump it. And these, we had a hay hoist. There was an electric winch thing that pulled the hay up and down the track, but a lot of people pulled the hay up with a horse or a tractor and, and then pulled it down and dumped the hay. Uh, uh, so it, it was quite a bit different than what we might uh, uh, see today. Uh, the, the other thing is that uh, I can, when I was like uh, old, four or five years old, old enough to know what was happening, uh, I always knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a farmer. And so, you know, that was, that's my life. Uh, and I'm <clears throat> lucky enough to still have that opportunity today. Uh, uh, and, well, another thing I might add, I went to school. I went to school within 500 feet of the farm, one room school. And I used to go home at, at noon and do chores and you know, had an hour off. And I went from a one room school to Spalding High School, which had was 213 kids in my class. And I think today, of a, and I thumbed the school and back, <laughs> but I think a, a culture shock that was, and, and how it is today. <laughs> you know. Uh, so anyway, that's pretty much uh, my portfolio. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's the 
we, we, we did it pretty well on our three minute to five minute introduction. So. <laughs> Very much so, yeah. My friend. But yeah, anyway, maybe I'll shed a little light on the fact that I'm not going to lead this. I'm just going to make some suggestions and we're going to go from there. But anyway, with that being said, I would love if I saw some hands raised. If not, we're going to pick some of my boring questions. <laughs> I don't either. Yeah, I just want these guys. I want these guys to uh, reflect on maybe what age they started driving car equipment. <laughs> so they want to know what age you started driving car equipment. Probably uh, uh, too young. <laughs> several jobs for that tractor, especially during hay. So uh, I think I was on raking hay at 10 years old, probably. Um, and then the jobs came more and more after that. But I think raking hay was probably my first job at around 10. It was probably about the same for me. Of course, I had a brother that was a year older than me, so he got the mowing and the bailing, and I got the raking and the tapping. <laughs> I was about 12 years old, and my grandfather and I were picking up brush in the orchard. He says, you want to drive that thing? Well, he didn't have to ask me twice. <laughs> <laughs> we used to have a little Ford, 8N. We bought new from Ted Green over the stock bridge. They used to sell farm machinery over there. And uh, my dad worked in the woods. And I got the job of skidding logs. They would cut them, and my brothers would help them get them ready. And I got this for a long time. The only two gears I knew in that tractor was second and reverse. <laughs> I, I think I probably started driving about that same age. I, I do remember the, uh, the only reason I didn't start driving earlier was we had a farm all age. And if you're familiar with the old farm all ages, the seat sat way back and the clutch way up here. So until your legs get long enough, there's no way in hell you're going to drive it. <laughs> yeah, we started early. Got a couple of stories. Actually, we started as soon as we had strength enough to push the clutch down. And sometimes it took both legs. So it was, we started real early. And my sister Grace is a year and a half older than I am. And she tells them the story is that the first time she drove, my father was with her. And they were driving along and they came to a, a gateway, which was poles, three poles. They went up fairly close and father says, you're going to stop? And she didn't know how. <laughs> we had to repair that fence. <laughs> she seemed to be a little bit of an issue. <laughs> uh, well, as I said earlier, I had two older brothers and they got to drive the drive. At probably uh, seven years old, uh, I got the job of milking. <laughs> and I was small enough, so we had an in-ground can cooler. But I was young enough, small enough, so I couldn't put the cans in the cooler. But I was uh, old enough, so I could milk. <laughs> uh, that's probably uh, about how that worked out. Was that by hand? So the, the, que the question is, when, when you first learned how to milk, was it by hand or was it by uh, machine? No, we had uh, milk machines. The old Henry milk machine, you had to work on them as much as you used to. They were vacuum. <laughs> they, they, uh, so was the vacuum, was there a vacuum pump or did you pull vacuum off a, a motor, off a tractor or a truck? Or? Uh, no, we used we had a vacuum pump. The electricity was out. We would uh, the, the the tractors on the intake manifold uh, had a a, a uh, stock off. We called the what you plug the plug the pulsator into through a holes. Uh, and when the electricity was off, you would you would use the tractor to milk one cow at a time. With. Uh, the vacuum pump, we could milk two cows uh, at a time. 
was also, uh, my father never had uh, watering for the cows in the barn. They always went out down to, and we had to, uh, in the winter time, you had to uh, get a stove, there was a stove in, in the uh, tank, and you had to fire that up because there was ice on it. And you had to wait until the ice melted, and then you'd go and break it with an ax or whatever. But uh, in later years, I said, hmm, in the wintertime, the cows didn't make a whole lot of milk. So, wait a minute, <laughs> something to do with how much water they could get. <laughs> and of course, he always timed it so that the, the cows came in in the springtime when they were out on grass. And uh, that was a couple of things to mention. Uh, I have put hay on a wagon by hand, and uh, we had a scattering. We always had a dump rate, which my father always had converted horse-drawn equipment to uh, to the tractor, and the tractor was made and it came from Ted Green Ford. And I remember, I can remember when that came. Uh, it was it was quite a big day, and uh, it was uh, quite an innovation. And he had a uh, a mower that was six foot, but it wasn't in the back. It came off the side, and uh, it was innovative at the time. And he went around and did cut the rolling for people who still had the horses because he could do it so much quicker. So that was part of his income for three or four years. He, he went quite a few farms around the mow the hay. Uh, yeah, we had a cement uh, pit like it stuck out. Of it. it was in the milk house and it stuck up about two foot and then it dropped down uh, probably two foot. Uh, so it was submerged in cold water. So, did you, the, the coal water was from, <coughs> became coal from electricity? Yeah, it, um, it was a refrigeration unit that cooled the water, circulated it, and kept it clean. So, a question back to you, you said you, uh, you guys would use ice, what was the ice used for? Well, he did have a cool, I remember, as you guys talk, I remember now, it's a long time ago. I remember he did have a, a can. He had about, he milked about 40 pet. It was a fairly good size farm, you know, for that time. Yeah. It was organic too at the time. I never knew it. You know, but, um, he had water cooling, but I remember them using ice for something. And I just was wondering if it was, yeah, yeah, I was a little kid. I mean, this was probably 1944, 45, 46. So I remember that. And that, that's why I asked the question. I wasn't sure my time frame or what he used it for. Without electricity, there's a lot you don't have at your house. Well, I mean, totally honest, I don't know when we got electricity, but uh, I can go back into the 40s and we always had electricity. Uh, so that's, I think, uh, it must have been in the 30s when we had electricity. Uh, I've heard a couple of stories, and I haven't told any, so I thought maybe it's mine. <laughs> I had two brothers. I was the youngest of the three, which I would agree is a rough spot to grow up in. Um, and the tractor driving experiences were varied. One I remember specifically, we had been to our dump, which is over in the back field, and we had gone with my two brothers, and my oldest brother, Bill, was driving the tractor, and we were headed back. And the trailer was hooked to the tractor with a pin, with no uh, key to it. So it, he had that in high gear and going just as tight as he could go over the bumps, and the pin came out. And the turn on the trailer went straight into the ground, and John and I went flying, because we were standing up in the back, pretending we were driving a horse. <laughs> so we were flying out over the top, flat, we didn't break our necks, and my brother never knew it came on foot. So he went all the way back to the barn and went to back into the trailer. <laughs> so he sheepishly came. 
came back looking to see where he left us. <laughs> so that was uh, that was always kind of a joke. It wasn't so much at the time, but uh, it, it, uh, it's fun now that we look back at it. So do you remember was electricity I was on the air fryer now in there in the valley or something? Yeah, I don't remember when we got it. I never I don't ever remember being allowed. No, I was there. I, I'm a, I'm a little bit later in the forties, so <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we had that juice. Uh, there we had electricity, but I can remember seeing pictures of Group 14 when it was not paid, and that was back in the 30s. Uh, so, and, and I think the, the uh, electricity come in, uh, in, in the early 30s to Group 14. So because I have some gray hair, uh, I'm going to have to tell a story too. But with, in regards to electricity, as I can remember as a kid, um, when the power went out, which was often in, in the valley, and still is to this day, honestly. But uh, um, the, the power would go out. And so that at the time, in my memory, there's about three farms that were in the valley. Allen's was one, my father's, and Mark Hackett's. And it was really, really exciting for me, and it, only because there was one generator. And so everybody would get that, and there was only one tractor that could run that generator. You know, so this is in the 70s, you know, and so that would be, we would take that generator wherever it got left the last time, you would get those cows milk. So there was lots of people around, and chores were all of a sudden became easy, you know, and then, and then you went down to the neighbor's farm, Mark's, or Allen's was next, or whatnot, and you did those chores. And those but anyway, I'm looking for another question back here. Did you have a question? Yeah. So, I don't have to push that story. <laughs> I heard, by the way, I read somewhere that I think it's Victory didn't get electricity until 1960-something, which totally amazed me. That's right. Now, Steve, your father and put up the Victory, but they found the electricity that was revealed. But he had a nice house. Give him the microphone. And the ice house worked out great. It was a small building. It was insulated with sawdust. And it worked. And I had a trough in one end. And it worked. We kept the, the cans of milk in that trough until they came to collect it. And that ice house worked real great until my mother decided she was going to smoke some hams and hung them above that trough and had a little too much fire. And John came up and asked her what she wanted to do with the hams. She thought, after the fire was put out, she thought that was a little crude. He said, what had happened was when it started to start the water, it filled that trough, the hams dropped down, and they were fine. Of course, there's some debate as to who had the first rubber tire tractor in the valley. We had a two end. And my neighbor came up and asked my father, how do you expect to ever, ever afford that? Next year, he had a two out. <laughs> Second comment, and I'll be quite a minute at least. Um, Dennis, you mentioned Roy Lovett. He and Jesse Fisk are my two heroes mm -hmm. because he ran the barn at my, grand, my weekly grandparents' farm um, on Ridge Road. And that man had the patience of Job. Because all of us kids who came up in the summer would just hightail it to the barn. And I'm sure I was maybe a leading contender for wanting to know everything. Everything you could tell me about cows and milking and hay and why can't I go see the bull, etc. You know, it was just made life wonderful for me. And I remember asking Abbott, uh, Royal Brother, if, when I was 12, 
I'm old enough to help with the hay. Dear girl, said he. And I said, that is irrelevant. <laughs> and he finally succumbed and let me help hay. What we did was use those forks, those crazy field forks, to roll, to roll it, kind of. Because it was in rows, you know, rolled up. And then just throw it on the top of the truck. And of course, Mom was horrified when she saw the results of me. <laughs> but oh my goodness, we had so much fun. Because it was either in the barn with him, or riding at Jesse's, or swimming at the pond. And it was heaven. That's why I'm here. <laughs> Did before trackers, which I imagine would be horsepower. Oh yeah, yeah. I was I was a little bit before my time. I, I've seen pictures, but I never had the experience. <laughs> yeah, we had horses, a team of horses, and uh, it was quite a challenge. Uh, my father used them; that's what we had. But he was actually afraid of horses and was very very cautious, and he sort of instilled that I don't like horses today. <laughs> when they came in from the field to get in the barn, we had to go somewhere else. And because, you know, he was, he was afraid of what might happen. And I can remember using them when we were hanging sometimes. And on the front of the wagon, which is an iron wheel wagon, they, we, we had to put a strap in, a metal strap in front. And that was to hold the kid in from falling off while you had a hold of the reins. And I can remember that sometimes that got a little uncomfortable when you were, you know, you, you were had your shirts gone because it was hot, and you had to hang on to the reins and drive those horses. And yeah, I can remember doing that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> horses, I haven't got any compliment. <laughs> So the question is uh, the era from horses to tractors. Well, I never drove any horses. My grandfather had a top layer on the farm, but I don't remember him doing anything with them. <laughs> <laughs> he went out with the cows and ate grass. And my uncle finally got him. He was a horse guy. He came, got him one day. And about the power coming through, I think it was around 1950, give or take a Because I can remember the, the struggle line, the power of the line by the house with a team of horses. Oh. I think it was around 1950, but I'm not sure. I said that he had, his dad had a 20 cow farm. That was a good sized farm back then. Yep, that's what he had. A lot of them were smaller than that. And you had the right, I don't know about those jerseys and Halsteeds. <laughs> my, my grandfather was a jersey man. And the guy over on the corner there where our demic is now was a Halstead man. Yeah. They used to pick on each other. So they got to talking one day. Uh, the other guy says to my grandfather, he says, well, you can tell when you've got a purebred jersey. You milk her out and you dump the milk in the pail and you throw a bean in there. And if the mountain don't cover the bean, you've got a jersey. <laughs> 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 my grandfather says, well, he says, uh, how you can tell if you've got a purebred Holstein, you melt her out and you pull the back in the pail and you throw a bean in there and you can look right out and you can see the bean. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm thinking, well, the first round bale that I remember was at Gage's. And they had a bale that bailed these little round bales. And that was the first round bale that I ever saw. And that was a long time ago. What, what time frame was that? Oh, in the 50s. <coughs> yeah, Alice Jones. Alice Jones. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. And that was different. It, it, it was, but. Uh, we talked about all the equipment, and I just happened to think 
that your dad had that round bailer. Um, yeah, there's there's lots of stories when we get started, and uh, they would go on. But uh, the the cows, um, Jerseys were the popular breed, in my recollection, in those days. Um, you know, it's always been that joke about. Uh, you probably should know the Holstein last, so you have something to wash out your machines with. Um, <laughs> but uh, jerseys were pretty efficient during those times. And, uh, and they were, I think, the pots of really, but there's different opinions that go down the line here. But even uh, spray car milk jerseys back in the day. And uh, so, anyways. But what did you guys do? Well, we were Guernseys. Uh, we started out with Guernseys, uh, and uh, like the old golden, golden Guernsey milk, so the story went, and that was what my father was attracted to. We slowly went over to Guernseys, but that was kind of, <clears throat> although there were some Guernsey farms around at that time, uh, but uh, yeah, it was a little different. During the mid fifties, we when we had we did square bales, but the method of picking them up, we had what was called a Hebert bale loader. This guy up in Williamstown invented this thing called a bale loader, and it hooked onto the side of the truck, and we left one sideboard on the truck. It had its own set of wheels and a conveyor chain, so. My mother and my sister and younger brother and all of them weren't old enough to throw bales. You'd roll them into a straight line and you'd drive around in your truck with this thing and it would bring, it, bring them up, up on the truck. So you had one guy riding in the truck back in the hay. So we always picked it up with a Hebert mail order. That was in the mid 50s. Yeah, I'll, I'll give it to my dad here. On the Heber bale loader, so uh, our, our farm, um, we farm like, I don't know, 12, 13, 1400 acres of cropland now. Anyway, one of these fields in Williamstown that we use, we got uh, stuck in this wet hole in the middle of the field. So I'm like, you know, what's this all about? So I. Larry Hebert owns the land now, which is the son of the, or grandson maybe, of the, the Hebert Dale loader inventor. And he's like, well, that's where my grandfather's factory was. Uh, and I'm like, well, what was it for a factory? And anyway, it was a well there for water that fed the factory, and they made the Hebert barrel. So life comes around. <laughs> And we'll we didn't have one of those Hebert bill owners, it was me and my two brothers, we were there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, the other thing I, I thought of like some of your Dave, some farm, they pastured your cows. I mean, come, come May, you pastured your cows. That, that was the way you did it. And some farms didn't have enough pasture, and they used to have what they call a summer farm. And so they would drive their cows to the summer farm and, and milk their cows there in the summer and drive them back in the winter. And there was quite a number of farms that, that did this. So we were fortunate. We had a 200 acre wood log, which is now a wood log, but back then it was an open pasture. <laughs> but I can remember being a kid and walking up there and finding the cows. <laughs> All right, we're ready for some more questions here. Is there a microphone back? Yeah, okay, we're gonna go over here first, Steve. So my question is about uh, marketplace, and I think about this quite a bit because I spent a lot of my hours in the old Whiting milk plant building down on Pearl Street in Randolph, which is pretty much the same as it was in 1920, just with a bunch of sewing machines now. And I think about what milk price was back, say, when you were growing up, John, um, or how it may have changed over the years, and kind of what that equivalent would be today, Keith, if you can quantify that in any way, or 
maybe you have to do it through volume of farms in Brookfield. So the question is uh, what milk price was back in the time? Well, I, I think my mother uh, had some old milk slaps, and I believe they were in Keith's office, where they got a, a, a dollar something, a hundred dollar, 35 cents, a hundred weight. Uh, for the milk, it went to the Gulf of Creamery. Uh, and and that's, uh, that, that's about all I can remember of that. But that was adequate back then. As I got a little side note, uh, it's, uh, we, we own some land, my wife and I do, off Montgomery Road, and there's a place up there where I can stand and look and I can count what used to be seven farms. So they're all small, they're all gone, and it's now all spray farm land for, for their crops. It's pretty amazing how it's changed. And I suspect that there's more cow's milk on Route 14 now than there ever was, no matter what year. That, I'd like to reflect on that a little bit too, that, uh, for those of you familiar with the original, that I was thinking today that if uh, you went back 35 years, if you went from the historical house and you went all the way out to uh, the Abbott farm now, Chester Abbott's farm, if you included his farm, you could probably count eight dairy farms that were operating at that time. And where I grew up in Brookfield Center, um, <coughs> There was the Terrian farm, there was a Pearl farm, there was a Little Rock farm, there was our farm, uh, there was the Milner farm. And, but the thing that was so amazing was that when all the work was done, with these were all large families, the Terrians and the Little Rocks, that when we'd get together at night at dusk to play kick the can, we would have anywhere from 15 to 25 kids. Just unbelievable. And I think about that so often, that how kids grow up today, and you know, they, don't, they can't get away from the television or the video game. You know, we used to just go kick the can around in the dark and chase each other around. <laughs> so they are mine, just terriers. <laughs> so the original question was about milk prices, if there was any recollection of that. I don't remember what it was back then. I'm not sure.
And uh, 
uh, and he's like, well, a little older, he got to be older than I was, but he'd come down and check in on cars there in intermission. If he likes you, he'd take his hat off and put it on the car and have a beer with him. <laughs> put his hat back on, go down the roof. <laughs> what year were the dances? What years? Well, this would be 50s, late 50s, but they, they probably went mostly through the 50s, I would say, into the 60s, until Mountain View opened up there. I remember our actors saying, you couldn't understand why <coughs> had to throw an empty beer bottle of fire out into the pasture. <laughs> <laughs> this is Arthur Gaylord. Yeah. <laughs> what was the answer? <laughs> <laughs> you, you guys want to comment on that? Can I talk? You can. I think whoever's next here, yeah. I've got a story I want to tell Steve O'Connor. Dennis. 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 I called him Steve earlier. So, uh, you mentioned, I think, when the fellows used to get together and they used share their equipment and it would be a real nice thing. I remember, I think it might have been in uh, 41, 42. <coughs> I had graduated from the dump race but I was available, and uh, they told me that I might just as well drive the team that ran the forklift. Okay. Well, I wasn't having a very good luck with that team. And Julian said, you know, you don't have to learn to cuss. <laughs> <laughs> Some more hands there. Yeah, sure. That's good enough. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming out tonight, and I appreciate it. Um, and I know you're getting kind of tired, but I think that um, I appreciate all your the bygone era um, stories, but I think that I'm really interested in finding out what your thoughts are on the vanishing landscape of Vermont and um, the dairy farms and if any of your family is taking over or finding a different way to diversify or um, the or the latter. Well it certainly is a concern. Um, I don't know what the solution is. Um, the farms that are going now, speaking of dairy, uh, bigger and bigger and bigger, and they're taking more and more of the land. Uh, and then the smaller farms, which are diversified, uh, either organic or vegetables or both, um, they have a hard time as well. And it's a lot of work. And so they're young, but the time will tell after they've been doing that for 15, 20 years as they are still there. So it's certainly a deep concern uh, as far as the 
uh, landscape is concerned because it's always been our biggest asset from an income standpoint from the state for tourism and that sort of thing. Um, I have a brother that uh, still has a farm. He doesn't farm it, but he still owns it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a big concern. One program that helps the uh, farmers quite a lot is that boost value program where your land is taxed on its use. Uh, that basically saves a uh, tremendous amount of money on the property tax, but I think without that program, you'd see more and more land being developed, uh, built on, and uh, you know, it would be hard to keep it all open like it is without you know, a good program like that. Well, it seems like it's depending more and more on tourism all the time. And a lot of these little farms, like the boys said, they're diversifying. So, there's a lot less farms than they used to be. They used to be able to go around just about any road around there. There was at least one or two farms. They're all gone. Just a few big ones. I think that uh, while a lot of the smaller farms have disappeared, I think a lot of the farming methods in the last 15 years and the way the large farmers are taking care of their land and stopping runoff and so forth, but it's keeping the property open, keeping the metals open, which I think is still a great tourism thing. I think the rebirth of the small dairy farms. You know, some of the organic farmers have done it, but it's a tough road to hold, and I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, it's a shame to see the fields. You drive around almost any road, and you'll see some, about 20 years ago, that was an open field, and now it's a lot of brush. And it's just a shame to see, but it uh, seems to be what's happening. And if you go to the grocery store, and you read some of the labels, distributed by this California company, mm -hmm. wait a minute. This is Vermont, but it's got California on the labels, which is a little scary. Uh, the, uh, the, if you, you know, back when I started farming, uh, Wisconsin was the big dairy state. They, they produced, you know, 30 percent, or in that area, maybe 25 percent of the milk produced in the United States. And now they're way down the line. Milk is made in California. Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, you know, Pennsylvania, places like that. Uh, so the, the technology has made it easier to supply the market uh, and, and change the complex of the whole dairy operation. When I started farming, uh, I had a margin of 6%. And when I get out, I, I had a margin of 2%. Uh, and I would, don't know what it is now, but it's a lot less than that. So the, in order to maintain, you just had to produce more product. And, and the computer an analysis and uh, the availability of, of technology has, has made it possible for farmers to be more efficient. <laughs> Uh, that was a, a, a great question, Sherry, um, and uh, with that, farming has definitely changed. Um, but these guys grew up and, and farmed in an era that's brought farming to what it is today, whether we like it or not. Um, but anyway, with that being said, I see there's one more question, which I'm happy to do, and then it's eight. it'll be 8.30 here by the time that's over. Um, so we'll make this the last question. Thanks. I direct to you to, well, I have heard tell that we are suddenly allowed to grow hemp. I don't know why people aren't pulling on that bandwagon because about 20 years ago, maybe a little more, one of my son's friends who was in college in California sent me a list of 7,000 uses for hemp. Brookfield in the 1850s had a lot of businesses. 
And if we just turn these fields into hemp fields and put up a factory or two, we can go to Does anybody have a question? Okay. Not now. in the United States, those states have the Department of Ag registered with the federal government who does not recognize the legality of it, but they're allowing these 12 states to trial it. But just having 12 states trial it, the price of Canadian hemp has dropped 70% in the last year. So we can talk about people growing it. There actually has to be the market demand before you know, we have people resting a lot of it. So from that point, of view, that's not. So before I let Keith finish, we're going to put out the watermelon. I also want to say that I forgot to say your thank you present, and it's certainly not the weather. Is a bag of heirloom potatoes called purple white and have this beautiful purple pink skin. Chelsea's had them, and hopefully you can vouch for them. But we will give you those at the end, and I just want to really thank you. It was really special. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, Thank you guys. 